I have been reading, uh, which is uh, which is this representation of uh, graph. Sorry, uh, programs as graphs uh, for 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 a few uh, purposes that I will tell you about. Uh, disclaimer right at the beginning: I'm not a software engineer, so I don't know. And I'm not a deep learning researcher, so I don't know mostly what I'm talking about. So you guys should chime in whenever you can contribute to the conversation. It is mostly about, I'm going to tell you things that I learned and things that I uh, learned from the paper uh, and discussions that I had with people, but uh, I'm counting on you guys to chime in whenever uh, you see fit. So it's going to be mostly like a discussion. Uh, so we are prototyping the idea, idea of the discussion that we had. Uh, so this paper is from the Microsoft Research and uh, is recently uh, presented at iClear, like about two months ago, I think. Um, and yeah, so uh, why am I interested in this? This is just a plot, obviously. Um, uh, I advise a startup company called SEMA, and SEMA uh, has. Uh, the purpose and the vision of building tools uh, that help software engineers augment or automate software maintenance. Uh, some of the tools that we have, uh, or the company has, is based on uh, optimization methods. So you can do various types of optimization on source code, but what we are interested in figuring out is how can we apply NLP type techniques to source code to do various maintenance type uh, uh, scenarios like the things that I'm going to talk about in this paper. And the reason that it is important to go to uh, machine learning and deep learning for this type of work is that uh, a lot of what already exists in software maintenance space is based on people's best judgments and best practices and things like that. And they're not necessarily based on uh, data that exists and data is like GitHub. It has like a lot of you know, source code on it and issue reports and bugs and things like that. And you can, in principle, scrape all of that or call the GitHub API and get all the source code and, you know, build algorithms that predict bugs or things like that. So you're going to look into, uh, look into two sort of use cases that they talked about here in this paper. Um, so essentially the main contribution of the paper from the abstract is that they present, they propose to use uh, graphs to re represent syntactic and semantic structure uh, of source code uh, and use deep learning to learn a representation from those graphs. They use it for, uh, they use this thing called gated graph neural networks, <coughs> uh, which I will explain what it is. Uh, and they do two tasks, namely, uh, variable naming and variable misuse. Again, I will tell you what they are uh, down the line. But essentially, va variable naming is uh, if, if there are like a lot of blank spaces that could be the same variable, what should, should be the name of that variable? And variable misuse is I have used a variable in a certain place, but is that the correct variable? Or uh, And the second one is actually kind of interest, well the first one is very interesting too, but the second one is more interesting because uh, a lot of the time you choose a variable that is type correct, so everything runs, but it's not the variable you meant to write there. So, and the program will be able to find that sort of thing. Um, and they apply uh, their methodology on a bunch of open source projects and find some bugs in them and these good things. So this is an example of uh, what I just talked about. Say, uh, you wrote this line of the code, and you were nice and happy, and then you copy-pasted it, and you wanted to define this new variable first, but since you copy-pasted it, you forgot to change this. So in principle, this runs fine, and complies and all, but this is a mistake, because this was supposed to be first, not class. But since you copy-pasted it, you made the mistake. And the, and, and, um, and there is no easy way to find this unless you actually know what you're doing. And the idea of uh, tasks like these with machine learning is to be able to actually like literally highlight that, that that's not right. Um, yeah, as, I, as I said earlier, um, not everything is clear to me yet. So if 
I'm saying anything that you don't understand, please ask, and we should have a discussion about them. So let's let's look into the two tasks that we talked about. There is variable naming and variable misuse. In variable naming, what you're trying to do is grab a source code, like a piece of code, and essentially uh, remove all instances of a certain variable, right? So there's no reference to a variable, I don't know, uh, x12. That's a horrible name, you shouldn't use that, but let's say that's what you did. Uh, remove all of those, and then based on the context and how the variable is used in different places, the algorithm is supposed to learn that that variable is called x12. Hopefully it is a more expressive name that you're trying to fi figure out. Uh, and in the second task, what you're trying to figure out is uh, grab a piece of code, remove one variable, and then out of all the options that you have that are type correct for that certain variable, choose the one that actually matches there well. Essentially rank the variables that you have and see what is the most likely variable to use there. Uh, we'll see examples of these later. Uh, so the first thing that they do is uh, they talk about the importance of representing programs as uh, graphs. Uh, and here, what they're doing is they're drawing a comparison between how we do NLP usually, which is you grab a piece of text, you tokenize it, and do whatever you do on those tokens. That's all you work with. There is no extra structure that is needed to take into account or is useful to take into account. But here, if you're deal dealing with a formal language, it has a very strict uh, grammar, a very strict structure, otherwise it doesn't compile. And what they're saying is that you should use that to get better results. So essentially, they're proposing to use the structure of uh, source code in addition to the tokens uh, in order to be able to better to do a better job in, in different source analytics code uh, tasks. Uh, and the way they propose to do this is using, uh, the way to build the graph is using uh, ASD, the abstract syntax tree, uh, and the data flow. Uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about these two, but uh, does, do people know what abstract syntax tree is? Okay, so for those of you who don't know, I don't know either, no, I'm <laughs> So abstract syntax tree is essentially a representation of source code that your compiler uses to translate from whatever the, the representation of your code is into some intermediate language that machine understands. And usually it is a tree, well as, as the name says, it is a tree that represents the, uh, essentially the syntax of the program that you have. Uh, one example of that is something like that, say, you're writing the expression assert dot not null brackets and a bunch of other things. The abstract syntax tree for this is, so this, this whole thing is an, is, an is an expression statement, which is invocation expression, and then this is a member access expression, which is assert dot not null, etc. So you get the idea, like essentially you grab your, soft, your code and just go up, like, uh, I don't think I put the, the link in, but it is very interesting. There is a website called ASD Explorer, and on the left you can write your source code, for example, in a Scala, and on the left it gives you a JSON object, which is essentially the ASD of your source code. It's very fun to play with it, and you can see that it starts from like the, the top node, which is program or source or whatever. Then it goes to, I don't know, classes that you have or variables that you define and then breaks down to each other. It's a, it's a huge JSON object, but it has all the information, all the syntactic information of your code. I was looking for some uh, converted code to UML, universal uh, modeling language. So I'm not sure that it's now AST more popular or UML more popular to, uh, to represent the code. I think the SD, the SD is an intermediate, intermediate format. If I, I'm correct, it has been around like for, for, for it's like more an abstract concept. It has been around maybe for maybe since the 1950s. Okay. But it's just a way of intermediate step where and then you can do like comp comp compilation and all kind of interpretation of the program. So uh -huh. it's more like yeah. programming language thing. It's more for machines. 
It's not for humans. UML is more for humans, right? Yeah. UML is more for presentation and design. You use UML, but machines have to, uh, in order to compile, they have to know the uh, syntax tree. Okay, but they cannot use the UML similar thing? Uh, it's high level. I don't think it's designed for it. Yeah, like, okay. Can you define to a machine what, whatever symbol you're using in your UML? Okay, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. UML is a standard, but BST is, is a, basically is a tree. As long as you can use a tree to represent your program, yeah. you, you can you call it a BST. Right? So is that like an ASD or like a CSD? Because, well, it's actually not even like a tree, it's like a DAG because there's like some continuity information on the right. I'll, I'll on the explain this. Yeah. yeah I'll, so I think, but the ASD is basically if you have a grammar, if you have like a context-free grammar, and a lot of languages are like context-free grammars plus like epsilon plus some context information. So <clears throat> they might be like you know the authors might be fast and loose with their terminology, but this is mostly like what like compiler people call like a concrete syntax tree. So it's not like an abstract. So what is the difference of concrete syntax tree? And so the node types are like instead of, um, you know, like in an abstract syntax tree, you have like expression, statement, operator, like uh, delimiter, stuff like that in white space. And this is more of a, there's no like, you know, there's no uh, definitive uh, difference, but this is like more you have like your expressions are very fine grain and you possibly have like some variable binding, like scope binding basically. So you know at each point in the program or each node in the tree, what variable names are valid and you know like some typing information, not everything, but like it's a little bit more semantically enriched, if you will. So that's CST or, or uh, most, I mean like uh, terminology is not standard because like, you know, compiler internals are right. like black magic for the most part. Yeah. There's no like standardized terminology, but yeah. Okay. I don't think uh, whatever they're using here includes, for example, type information because they use type information uh, ext yeah, uh, as an extra feature, I guess. Uh, but like the, the thing that is uh, important to note here about AST is that it has a bunch of nodes uh, and a bunch of connections. So the, the blue ones are all like parental connections. So this is the parent of this, this is the child of that, etc. Uh, but AST doesn't really have this part. So it has a bunch of, they call them non-terminal nodes. So these are like the syntax and then terminal nodes, which are essentially the tokens you use to write your code. So essentially in AST, uh, these things don't exist. These edges don't exist, but because here they're trying to uh, uh, represent the program, they add these edges as well just to show the sequence of you know tokens that appear um, another thing that they add is data flow and it took me forever to understand well i don't even yet understand it but essentially what is happening there is that they're trying to enrich this representation because this representation has information about syntax and some semantic information based on how the variables and everything, all the tokens are used. Uh, but it doesn't really have information about how data is flowing uh, inside the code. And they try to add a bunch of edges to these. So essentially, there are going to be a bunch of extra edges here going on around uh, between variables only. So how the information from a variable moves on to another variable. An example of that is, let's say here you have the function definition, like x and y equals who, you know, y x larger than. So, and this is the, the data flow for that expression. Uh, it is, don't try to understand what's happening. I tried a lot. <laughs> um, so essentially, uh, oh, I have a link. Uh, essentially, uh, here what they're trying to do is uh, to do expressions like if a variable was last used in conjugation with another variable, then draw a line, draw an edge between them, or a variable rotating to another variable, uh, do a right, last right, compute it from. Uh, and this is the list that they use, like last read, last right, compute it from, uh, and a bunch of other things. Uh, for example, guarded by is if for example, you have an if statement and then update another variable. So say if you have an if statement, if x larger than 10, 
then a equals 5, right? So the value of a is guarded by x because unless x, if the statement is not right, the value is not updated. So you do a guarded by h. So they, they add a bunch of edges to the terminal tokens in the AST and connect them together through a bunch of these uh, data flow edges. So the nodes um, uh, at the two ends of the, uh, the an edge, they can be anything, any node in the AST? No. So only the terminal nodes, right? And only the variables have data flow. Okay. Like, sorry. The variables and objects, for example, if you have a function, you can have uh, an argument name of the function that it connects to it. Uh, but I think okay. it is only variables and ob uh, objects. Any more questions? Okay, so that's how they represent, uh, I guess, the source code with, it, it's a, with its structure and the data flow that is happening in it. And next, uh, they're going to, you know, using use neural net to represent that uh, and do computation on this graph. So they use this thing called graph neural net. Uh, and generally speaking, graph neural net, what you're trying to do is to learn a function, function of the graph uh, equals to something. For example, for a for a for a for a supervised task. For example, uh, your graph could represent a molecule, and what you're trying to do is to obtain one of its properties, like energy level or whatever. So F of that molecule equals the energy level. So that's the sort of problem that you're trying to solve. Another thing that you can do with these graph models is, uh, for example, if you have source code and you're trying to do anal analysis on it, like what you're doing here, or you're trying to do reasoning or knowledge graph. You have a knowledge graph, and you have a statements like A is B, B is C, C likes, you know, ice cream. Then you want to do inference that oh, A likes ice cream too. That's for the reason. Um, I actually saw a talk from one of the authors of the graph neural net that was talking about that reasoning. That might be interesting to look at it. Um, so, um, okay. Just a note of warning that now I'm talking about a different paper that is here, uh, just briefly to, to set up the background. So some of the notation uh, might be confusing as we go forward, but this is your warning. This is a different paper. Uh, so here, are, are people familiar with message passing? OK. So. Uh, I'm going to try my best to explain it because I don't understand it very well either. Uh, so essentially, when you try to learn, let's say this is a graph and you want to learn a representation for it. Uh, so what you can do is essentially initia initialize all of these nodes. Sorry, you want to learn a representation for each of the nodes, right? So let's say this is a molecule and these are atoms, and you want to learn a representation for each of the atoms, um, and so what you do is that you initialize all of these at whatever representation you want, one how to encoding or whatever it is. And then you do this sort of message passing kind of thing, which is essentially the following. Let's say you want to update the representation for two. You look at what nodes have an incoming edge to two, and what node has an outgoing edge from two to and then essentially what you do is that you do a sort of a sum. It's a nonlinear sum I'll show you. Uh, but you do a sum between the representation of these two that come here and uh, sum over all the outgoing ones to come here. And then you update this. And obviously, once you change that, the value of these ones are not correct. So you have to update those as well. So you, this is essentially a process that you keep doing until you get to a convergence. You get to a point that the representations of each of these don't change. Do you want to add to anything I said? Um, so if you have that, yeah, if you have a graphical model, so if you're kind of modeling a probability distribution where each of the nodes are kind of uh, either like explanatory like factors or like, you know, observables, uh, to your point, yeah, you're, you're trying to kind of minimize an energy function. 
the way you minimize it is if the energy functions, like the structure of the energy function is dictated by the, by the neighborhood of each, each node. So you have a term for each, um, like all the adjacent nodes of each node, then you can do that in steps. So you initialize like one, and especially if the graph is bipartite or like without loops, it actually converges. If it's not, if it's loopy, you never know. It might not converge, but there are like, you know, tricks around it. So yeah, you basically do that. You, you initialize one side, you pass messages, basically belief messages, so belief propagation right. about that value to, to the nodes on the other side. They update them, so, uh, like they, they update their values, their kind of uh, parameter set, and then they propagate back to the other side and like back and forth, kind of like EM basically until convergence. But uh, if, you don't, if you don't repeatedly don't all the nodes in the network get, get like the same score? No, it's not, you're, you're not averaging anything. Oh, you're basically okay. doing like a, you know, I know if I, if I have a certain parameter, I influence uh, probabilistically my neighbors in this way. So if I know their values, I know my, my own ML value from my immediate neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So in one round, I get, you know, I, I collect their information, I update myself in the next round. I use my updated information to update them. They kind of mix my information with their own neighbors, so it kind of propagates all over the graph, but everyone learns their own parameters. So you know, they don't like try to kind of average the value. It's like So the the first order update information comes from the nearest neighbors. So you only get information from the other ones in the next updates. So in the first update you're just like for this one you get an update only from one and yeah, I have a question. How do you synchronize this uh, procedure update? Because uh, you can, this must be a sequence. Update this first, this next, right? How do you synchronize it? So yeah. you, oh, sorry. Yeah. So you update the whole network and then do it again, yeah. and then do it again. Just keep updating the whole network all, uh, until it converges. Until it converges. What do or you, if it converges. Yeah. What do you do if the network is undirected? Say again? If you have an undirected network. Uh, so uh, you never you the example you give is like directed so A B. So can you have like two edges for like it was undirected means that it goes there like, and comes back right you can just do that. So undirected means that every edge is like in both direction. Sure. So like one two is just one two and you can go in both both direction. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. then you can just have two edges per pair of nodes right. So then by each update. You up, like you start with node one, you update all the neighbors, and then you go to node two, which is a neighbor of node one, and then you update it again, basically pass, passing it back and forth all the time. But it changes, right? Because yeah. error, because uh, the values propagate from other parts of the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Unless they're isolated, which then they wouldn't be yeah. useful. Yeah. So each hop, you're getting new information from like, like uh, more like far away places in the graph, or like. Yeah. Right. So just to make sure I'm on the same page. So here we are trying to learn a graph that represents a probability distribution that models some data set. Is that right? Or uh, you, you you're trying to learn a representation that sorry you you're trying to learn learn say a vector that represents each of these nodes uh, faithfully, and what you're trying to map out is uh, the fact that this node, other than some metadata that I'll, I'll talk about, have, has these connections with these other, uh, has these edges with other nodes and connected to these nodes. So that's the sort of thing that you're trying to picture uh, okay. or capture in your representation. Um, and uh, yeah, and this is sort of like the update rule essentially. For example. This is horrible, but this is, so H is the representation you're trying to learn. This is T minus one and this is T. So at time T, which is the T orientation, uh, essentially, for example, H of one is only updated by H of two, because that's what it is connected to. Uh, H two is updated by H one, H three, H four, etc. Uh, and the update rule looks something like this. Uh, so essentially H of, this is the representation for node V at time T, which is a function of a bunch of things. This is easier to see it this way. 
so essentially it's a sum over inward edges coming from node, sorry, sum over nodes that have inward uh, edges to V and a function of, uh, you know, a bunch of properties of the nodes, uh, properties of node V that you're uh, updating, the edge V prime V, the node V prime, that's where, the, the, this is the neighbor node, and H of T minus one, which is the representation at the previous step. And you do the same for the outgoing ones. Is that clear? So what is F star again? F star is this. Oh, okay. So F star is the representation that you're, is, is the function that you're trying to learn. Oh, okay. Right? And it has a form like this. Uh, and F uh, can be any function. You can choose what that is. Uh, for for the original graph movement paper, they proposed a linear function, for example. So you just use a linear function as f with those parameters, and you know, um, and it uses this Almeida Pinada algorithm to train. I have no idea what it is. Does anyone know that? Otherwise, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so for for the paper that we're looking at, they use gated graph neural nets. Uh, which is this paper, which is still the same paper as previous slides. Uh, so in a gated graph neural net, essentially what they do is that f is a GRU, that's all. So essentially they unroll time and use a GRU to do the recurrence. Uh, and they say that the advantage of doing this is that they can use backpropagation to train this model. It is more memory intensive than Almeida Pinata algorithm. Uh, but but at least you can use things that you know, and the update rule is exactly like uh, like GRU. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, each of the nodes in the graph, other than the edge information, they have metadata, right? So for example, uh, a node in a source code could be a variable, so it has like a text text corresponding to the name of that variable attached to it or it has information about the type of it, or other things, right? So essentially, the way they, the way they initialize their representation, so H of one is H at the step one for uh, node V. Uh, they write all that representation of the metadata, which, it, which could be the text of the variable, for example, variable name, uh, type, etc., cetera, in, uh, in this X, and pad it with a bunch of zeros, and that's the initial uh, representation they start from. The rest of it is just uh, GRU. So they have the, uh, sorry, what is this called? They have the reset function, they have the, sorry, reset gate. This is the, uh, help me. <laughs> uh, update gate, there you go. This is the update gate, uh, and the rest you should be very familiar. Um, so the, the problem with, or the property of the gated uh, graph neural net is that it, is, it can be only used to generate one output per node. So you just train it once and you get an output. Uh, but if you want to get a sequence out of a node, like instead of only one result, you want to get different results uh, that come at the sequence, then uh, you have to use this graph, gated graph sequence neural net which is essentially the same thing, just concatenated. Uh, so you start from some initial representation, uh, and uh, essentially what you're doing there is that these are like the node annotations, like the name, type, whatever, whatever. You initialize it into this uh, initial representations, like the one that has zero paddings. Then they use two gated graph neural networks, one of which presents, uh, one, one of which computes the output at time step one, and one of them uh, generates the output, computes the output for the next representation of the node. Uh, so remember, okay, so there are two times now. So one time is the time that you did to get to convergence, right? So that all is happening here. But there is a second time, which is the time in the sequence that you're generating. So which are these ones? So 
if say you want to generate three tokens and then concat them to be your variable name, right? So you can generate three tokens, concat them and be the, the variable name, then this would happen three times. Is that clear? So essentially you update the whole network, you get an outcome from the uh, node that you're interested in, then use the, this representation as the initial state of the next update, update the whole thing again, and you get this one, use that representation again, update the whole thing, you get the third outcome. You guys look very confused. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. so, so what, so this is a supervised learning problem, right? There's some output. Right? Yeah. So you are training this uh, uh, GRU on some outputs that you already have, right? So what are these outputs? That you, you are training it on? Um, for example, in, in the case of variable naming, it is the name of the name of the variable that you're trying to predict. So you divide the name down to its sub-tokens, and you're trying to predict those tokens here. Uh, it's like a recruit a neural network. Well, it, it is. It's inside. <laughs> <laughs> and these are like literally GRUs. Yeah. Sorry. These have GRUs. Uh, so, sorry, I missed that. Uh, Xi, Xi is. Chi uh, is. Uh, what's Chi? Sorry. What's Chi? Chi. Chi what? Oh, that's the label annotation. It is in my bag. Uh, that's the node annotation. So, uh, essentially, the name of the node, for example, if it is a variable name, it would be the text of that variable name, and other things like type and whatever you need. Like going back to here, this is X that you have in the next slide, and it is padded with a bunch of other information that you learn about how they are connected to different edges, etc. Uh, a question. Yeah, how, how do you use the GRU to different edges because uh, there's different relationships? So just one GRU with all edges, or just uh, use the different kernels, like different GRUs to different different edges? So that's that's what I talked about here, right? So in this in this update rule, you're summing over all the edges that are going out and coming in. So for any node, you sum over all of the edges, and once you keep doing that, you get to a I guess convergent converged solution for what the representation of that node is. It's very similar to what you do in word to vec I was yeah. thinking you, you told me before. Yeah. that you, you grab a context window and slide it through your text, right? Mm -hmm. And then whatever representation have you have for the word before and after, you average them and that would be the representation of the, co the token in the middle, and you just keep doing that until it converges, right? This is exactly the same, except that it is not linear anymore. It is just, you're doing that on a, on a graph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But basically, you go to an NLP and you neural translation. You you don't suppose there's any relationship there. You just that model learn. But here you are you're identified. There's I mean seven different edges, right? How do you I mean use the GRU to represent these seven different edges? Because uh, if you are uh, like uh, use a blend uh, to 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 format like the the neural, neural tra translation machine. You, 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 don't, you don't have to assume any relationship there. So well, you're, you're, itself, so. Except that you're assuming it's things. In, in, in neural translation machine, mm -hmm. what you're assuming is that you have a linear graph, right? And there are edges that are like, this token is going to this token, this token is going to this token, etc. So, like literally, if you flatten this out and don't have any 2D connections, mm -hmm. like just a string of nodes, mm -hmm. that's all you're doing with, uh, with machine translation, right? So you're just learning the representation over that. Machine translation, you, you assume there's maybe thousands or millions of rows there. So, but here you, you only have seven rows, seven edges. How do you enforce this? Them? This, this, is, this is one example. You can have like many graphs that you're learning from all of them, right? So no, you the edges, because uh, no, 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 I mean, another graph is you show there's different edges, the different relationships, mm -hmm. limited, because the formal language is different from a natural language. Yes. It's much simpler. So how do you uh, yield this kind of a simpler? Simpler because the vocabulary is smaller? Why, why is uh, I think the, the grammar is smaller, much smaller. Right? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an artificial language. That's a valid yeah. point. But uh, but still, there is um, there are a lot to be learned, right? It's not that. Um, I mean, uh, for natural language, you, you can have subdomains and learn um, uh, NLG or NLU for those subdomains which have smaller vocabularies. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there is still learning involved. And the, the relationship between the, the nodes of the graph is it is basically complicated. Yeah, but you, you just treat this uh, formal language the same as natural language. Yeah, I mean. The idea comes from it, right? So uh, for your node, um, you have a sequence. Something <coughs> comes in and something comes mm -hmm. comes out in sequence, yeah. right? So that that's why. Um, so like, what would you suggest? Mm -hmm. uh, vanilla feed forward wouldn't do it as well because it mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't um, capture the sequential nature of mm -hmm. this data. Mm -hmm. um, or what else? Or CNNs? I don't know. But this systems, um, RNNs seem to be most natural. I would have picked RNNs. But yeah, I, I understand so it's RNNs. Just like, because uh, this formula was different from natural language. You, you, you already identified seven rules to use them. So you, you know all the rules. But natural language, you, you don't know all the rules. You cannot identify them all. You identify all the nodes or other rules? It's the rules. The so, rules? So from you know all the rules, right? So the compiler will do that. Okay. No, OK. So yes. So we know, so we, in natural language, we, we thought we knew all the rules. No. Um, we thought, right? <laughs> we, we, we know that we don't know all the rules. And there are always exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the, we know all the rules if you want to compile them, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if something is typed correct, then uh, you, it would compile and the compiler wouldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. But we're looking for patterns mm -hmm. that are um, just, you would call it, I don't know, bad practice, right? And mm -hmm. that is not something that you can find, like you can try, um, but I don't think it's easy to write rules for. Yeah, you mean the error cannot find the bug compiler? Yeah. Right. yeah. So, like, if you're looking for bugs, mm -hmm. so bugs usually are things that it compiles and it's fine, mm -hmm. you know, like, your compiler, it is like based on your rules, it is completely syntactical, it is completely correct. But uh, from a logical point of view, that what you wanted to write, mm -hmm. that's not right, right? There's a, in the example that I showed you, for example. And the mm -hmm. fact that, like, we are not treating this like a natural language, we're treat, treating this, we're using the structure of the code, right? Like, the, the reason that we're using AST and data flow mm -hmm. is exactly for the reason that we have more information more reliable information about source code than we have about natural language. Other, like, because most of the natu natural language coding is based on this linear model of, you know, there are sequences that they come after each other and you, etc. But here, the reason that we have to go to a graph is the fact that we know more about formal languages, as you were saying. But how do you implement the AST in this uh, GRU structure? I mean, they can use AST. How, how do they, the two match together? So this this graph can be AST augmented by the extra edges that we talked about, right? And then you do all of these update rules that I talked about on the on the graph that corresponds to that. And GRU just comes like here. So F can be a GRU. And uh, your original question was, do you have one GRU per node? So yes, like for each of these updates, these can be GRUs and you sum over. Ah, that question. So what are the L's and the H's? Like, are the H's like the hidden states of the units right. and like the L's are the outputs? Or? No, L is, L, L, V is the, uh, the metadata of the node, like the name of the node, for example. Okay. L of V, V prime is the edge between V and V prime. Uh, it has a type, for example, like there are two different types, right? So this is a function of what type of nodes you have, for example, so the edge you have. So, so just uh, just to clarify for myself, F in its like fourth, like in its fourth place parameter is like a GRU, and the L's uh, uh, like are parameters. Like how, like it's uh, how how do we embed the L's uh, like specifically? So, um, like this. So all those information go to X. That's the input data, right? right. To the network. So all, all all extra information that you have goes to X, right? Okay. So, I don't know, edge, like whatever information you have the, about the edge, the name of the node, the type of the node, whatever you have, that goes to X. Mm -hmm. And anything that you learn from the graph comes to from comes into these zeros that you're padding this with. 
And do you enforce like consistency in like the H, uh, the H vector, like the, the initial segment? Do you like fix it or like uh, peg it to be like the same value throughout the yeah. learning, or does it does it? Yeah. Yeah, we were wondering about that. I'm not sure. Uh, I have to go back and check that. But yeah, that's a valid question. I don't know if they keep the X as is or they allow that to update. It. Uh, my guess is that they allow it to update, but. I'm just guessing. So what's the major difference between the uh, graph convolution, convolutional uh, network and <laughs> so Yeah, I didn't look into convolutional. Do you want to present it next time? No. <laughs> yes! I should be done. I should be done. You're, you're a prime different. member of this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the big difference yeah. between this and graph convolutional network is that the graph convolution neural network is doing the convolution of the whole network in one iteration. Mm -hmm. So basically, it has a hyperparameter that says how much features do you take from yourself and how much do you take from your neighbors. And then it uses this to kind of averages your feature set. Mm -hmm. So what the graph convolution network does is like to recalculate your features based on a network. And then you get the new feature representation for each of your nodes. Okay. And then you do the classification on your nodes, given the features. Yeah. And basically what it does, it takes the, the adjacency matrix and multiplies it with a weight matrix. Okay. And then do this over repeatedly. And then when it does the back propagation, uh -huh. it takes kind of uh, a chibiture polynomial of the approximation for the error. Uh -huh. And this is basically where this comes, that basically this uh, weight multiplication with the network is kind of how you transfer the information through the network. Mm -hmm. It's a similar idea that you have this kind of information propagation through the network. Okay. What, do you, what, do you, what you actually propagate in the network is uh, uh, are the features, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if you're, all your neighbors have similar features, they get very similar features. And then in the other local neighborhood, they have similar features, they get similar features. And the danger with the graph convolution network, what is described in the paper, they had like two or three convolutions, the best optimum. They said, oh, if you do with more than six convolutions, all the features become almost identical. Yeah. And that's because of the six degree of freedom. So basically, you just, at that point, you basically convoluted every feature with every feature very low. Um, they, they mentioned in the paper that they, for the, these tasks, they look at, looks at the graph convolutional networks and the performance was lower. Okay, yeah. Uh, but I didn't look into it. So, question. So, there's a lot of like uh, combinatorial like uh, research uh, from like way back when, like 50s to the 70s, about like like matroid theory characterization of graphs and like you know forbidden like minors and like graph contraction. So, I've always been like you know I've, I've read a lot of papers and like using like you know neural nets and like trees or like tree structures. Has everyone ever like even like referenced that literature? Like you know because literally a lot of the um, a lot of these like multi hops and like you know like the leaf propagation type things in graphs that are generally loopy would be, um, you know, I presume, I'm not smart enough to kind of, you know, derive the equations, but I presume, like, you know, there's some way of uh, uh, modeling them better using, like, those, like, forbidden minors or, like, yep. you know, basically equivalent graphs in terms of connectivity or, like, you know, large scale structure. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, good question. So, so the, the, Sorry, are you finished? <laughs> the, the X doesn't contain the L's. The L's are in the A and the B, right? Uh, maybe I misunderstood you. Sorry, say again? So uh, A and B contains this extra that... Uh, about A the and B? Yeah. Uh, no. A and B are learnable or parameters. Yeah, yeah, these are learnable parameters. These are things that you're learning. So if you go to the... To yeah, it's uh, a different thing, or maybe the same paper. But again, like A and B are things that you're learning here. So A and B are kind of like similar to like classical RNNs, like elements, like you know, 1980s, like RNN, like before the LSDN and GRE revolution. So kind of linear functions, basically. Yeah, they're, they're so you can learn them from, from data. Okay, so A is a coefficient and B is a bias. Wait, okay, sure. so, so X doesn't contain anything the about these L's, the extra. They, they do, I don't understand what you're concluding. How, how are you concluding? They don't. They do, why they not? Do they do? Yes. 
I'm, I'm, I'm confused by your confusion. <laughs> <laughs> so in the other slide, the, the L's, I guess, were indexing the B and the A. So here, H, T minus 1 would be the X, I guess, in the other slide, or the, the previous state. Oh, they're, they're not contained. They're, they're, they're essentially they're a function of these, right? Not necessarily. Like, yeah, you learn them, but they depend on these. Well, like, the value of B depends on what these are, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, they're like an index. Right, or like an index, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, can I just say something in the previous slide? So your F uh, superscript 1 X. Right, mm -hmm. um, that gives you that creates the input uh, that is x two, That's right. which is then input to your um, next hidden state, which then right. generates. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, if I'm like understanding it correctly, those um uh, like the, the forty five degree arrows are like the time dimension, not, not the time dimension. So what is the um? So yeah, like the um. This is time. Th That's right. That's a time. So sequence. left to right is time. Right. Uh, what is where are the sideways things? Are they like different modalities or different like edge labels or? Well, these are the different time steps, right? So this is time step one. This is time step two. So. They produce the outputs. So you have a variable or you give me a function mm -hmm. name something underscore something underscore something, right? Uh, the first one is the first something. The second output O two is the second something. Name of your variable. So variable naming would be okay. Uh, so so um, so if you're like generating tokens, like uh, like letter tokens or like you know stuff or whatever tokens. Uh, exactly. And the um, okay. So this is essentially the sequence that you're generating, like the first token in the sequence token. So maybe I'm confused because you mentioned something about like double nesting or double unrolling, like one unrolling for the. Um, for the different modalities, different right. edge label types, and one unrolling for the right. time steps. So those those happen in these ones, right? Because you do you do a bunch of time steps in each of these oh, okay. to get to the convergence. Oh, here okay. And there. okay. Right. So you're kind of nested along the same dimension, right. basically. Exactly. But you only take outputs once you're kind of established. That's right. Okay. So you go until you converge. You output. Then you go to the next one. You go until you converge. You output. It's okay. But all of this is happening on the same graph on the same node. Right. You haven't even got into the heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, to set up the problem, as I mentioned a few times, the initial node representation is uh, essentially a concatenation of information about the text node and the type information, things like that. Um, then they set up two different graphs for the two different tasks that they are uh, going to do. For variable naming, uh, they essentially grab the graph corresponding to the source code. Uh, they remove all instances of the certain variable that they want to name. So that variable doesn't exist in the source code, in the graph at all. Um, the next step is uh, that they do uh, the graph sorry, gated graph sequence neural network to predict uh, sequences like these. So for example, first token is input, second token is a stream, third token is buffer, to generate a variable name that is input stream buffer. So you are learning from how the other variables are being named in their context. That's right. Okay. So you're learning that name, this sequence of subtokens to generate that name, based on the context and how the variable is used and all that. Uh, they don't talk a lot about this task. They talk a lot about the other task because they assume this is much harder. They give like the accuracies and all that, but they... So question, like input stream buffer. Like, so, so one of the things is um, there's like two different kind of schools of thought, or not schools of thought, but like ways of writing programs. One is like, you know, somebody like jokingly calls it like a, programming by accretion, which is Java, like you have like input stream buffer, like factory, factory, factory generator, whatever, but where this kind of thing might be conducive, whereas like Python, you generally kind of uh, more data flow oriented. So, you know, you're kind of like, you're, you're manipulating the same thing, like you're not, 
creating like a stream around like a buffer around like your input, something like what have you. So did they ever like, cause I noticed like their example was like C Sharp, which is basically practically Java for all intents and purposes. Much better. Uh, it is much better, but like, <laughs> you know, as far as we're concerned, it's not Python, so uh, fails to be much, much better. So. Uh, uh, does that like ever like ha have they ever like considered or like even like bring it up that you know this might not be? I mean, no no Py Python code base that I know of has this naming convention or anything even approaching it. Uh, I mean, in principle, this is capable of learning your naming convention. So based on other you know namings that you've done in your code, as long as there are there is a bit of pattern into them, you can learn those because this is a sequence generation. So if you're using a different way to name your variables, you just learn the different sequence and generates that. That's my hand baby way to say it, that they didn't really talk about that much. But in principle, the whole idea here is that it learns your naming convention, whatever it is. So they learn the Python pet 8 convention? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering like copy pet 8 or like, you know, that kind of thing, like, you know, snake versus like camel, but um, yeah. um more even like Python is more about like verbs and like what you do with the data. Like Java is more about like nouns and how you kind of wrap things around in different like objects. Yeah. Um, I mean, as long as you train it on, uh, I guess a corpus that is consistent in terms of naming conventions, it can just learn that in principle, or that's the desired future state at least. Um, so that's uh, that's for and they. They use maximum likelihood objective to train this. Uh, they are very, very vague about like, the details of like what is the expression for this, for example. But I assume it's a straightforward, it's based on the sequences and their ground. OK, so this is the variable misuse one, uh, which is more difficult to explain, but I'll try my best. Uh, so essentially, uh, the task here is, here is the graph representing your code. And I'm going to take away uh, one of these variable names. Um, and out of, on average, four type correct variables that you have in your source code, you have to tell me which one is the correct one to put back there. So in principle, that's simple. But let's see. Uh, so what they do is that uh, they grab the source code. Did you break it? <laughs> <laughs> they grab the source code and they go to the variable that is removed. So they repl replace that node with a placeholder node. And they remove the edge, sorry, data flow edges that depend on that variable. Okay. So they remove the node and put some V on their line of slot, just a placeholder in place of it. And they remove all the edges that uh, are dependent on what that variable is. And those edges are things like last use, last write, guarded by, etc. So and then they want to reuse these edges. So what they do is that they grab all the candidate variables, let's say there are four candidate variables, and they pretend that each of these variables is the one that is going to be in the, used in that place, and connect it to the rest of the graph through these four edges that they removed from the first one. Right? So essentially they sort of break the node. One is the placeholder, one is the candidate. The candidate has all the edges corresponding to uh, depending on what the variable is, and the rest of the edges are connected to the placeholder. And they connect all the candidates to the same graph. So say you have four candidates, then you would have one node that is empty, and like that would be a slot, uh, and four nodes that are, uh, that are the candidate variables. And when I say they don't add these nodes, these already exist, right? These variables exist in the code. They just do the connections. Um, and so what they're essentially doing uh, here is that with this, they're learning a representation that uh, is, a repre is representative of the context. So independ independent of what that variable is, what is the context around it? 
And with this one, what they're learning is if I wanted to use the certain variable, what is the representation of the usage of that variable? You look very confused. <laughs> I have a bunch of questions, but uh, kind of to clarify for myself. So, because the data flow representation that you showed in the beginning was kind of like SSA, like, you know, that static single assignment, which is um, you basically number the, the successive uses of the same variable with like integer indices. And so you kind of you never use the same name twice, and then you can kind of connect them with like you like use def like use edge definition and chains, and that's basically I think the data flow edges. So we only remove the the one hop context. So if if one variable is like erased, we don't remove all the other like uh, you know what I mean. If it's if it's used like four times in the source code, only the only the immediate connections with that's right. Okay, but that's not right. the other connections. That's so right. we still know. How that value kind of evolves through the program. That's right. Yeah. So you're because if you remove wherever that variable shows up, then you don't really have that variable to place it there. So you still want that variable to exist somewhere, so that 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 would be one of your candidates. More questions. Spaces. Can you give a concrete example? <laughs> Uh, uh, keep going. Yeah, um, I would have to draw that, and I don't have it here. Okay, let's see. Let's see if you. Uh, so, I'm going to repeat what I said at the end once more to see okay. if that makes more sense. Make <laughs> For example, right. So, if you have four candidates that can all uh, fit into that place and they're type correct and it compiles and all good. You'll have four of those. So, uh, question. So you're you're inserting every candidate that is um, type consistent, but um, the mock edges, like the mock data flow edges that you're putting in, are they all like patterned after the one for the correct variable? So you know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't know if, if I conveyed what I meant. Um, those edges are the ones for the correct <coughs> name, or like uh, just uh. Like literally for the correct variable name, or for those respective like candidates that you're putting in. I mean, it could be. So those edges depend on that particular place that the variable is, right? It doesn't depend on the variable itself necessarily. So if you have like x equals one or a equals one, like it doesn't care if you're using x or a. Like the the flow is still one going to x, or well, one yeah. going to b, right? You see what I mean? It doesn't like depend on the name, but it depends on. So if you have a way of like hashing the values universally, they're like hashing not not the values, the expression trees, if you will, but the evolution of computation of the program. I don't know how to how to phrase sure. it, but uh, uh, yes, your point is correct that the variable name is only like you know accidental in, in in the grand scheme of things. But like different different candidate variables come from different kind of lineages through a program. So. Right. What are their the mock edges that you replicate at that site at that candidate program site? Are they the true like? There, there is a unique solution to that, right? There is like you don't have freedom. A, like given given this variable that is here, there is only one way to draw data flow from it. You see what no, I mean? it's not. It's not like a program point can be. Yeah, if you if you like erase the name the identity of the variable that's there. At any given program site, you can make use of a bunch of values that have been, you know, everything that has been computed up to that point and hasn't been overwritten, you can actually use. Sure. But the everything ones that, that are live, basically. Right. But all the variables that I type correct, those are all the candidates that you're considering here, and the data flow for all of those is unique. Like no, it's not. Okay. Like that, the, that is called like what is live. So at any given program point, you have a bunch of variables that are live. If you have typing in addition, you can constrain them to a set that, that are like type compatible, but you can have many different live values. So, you know, at any given point, so say integers. If I'm doing like some, you know, I'm, I'm doing like software pipelining. So I'm, I'm, I want to like do six calculations, like almost six independent calculations in parallel. So at any given time, I have six intermediate values that are representing six like different lines of computation. All of those are of the same type, are integer, 
So if I erase the identity of variable at any given point, any of those six lines of value evolution could be used at that point. I don't find. No, I don't. But only the most like recent one could be possible there. All right, right. you're removing the variable from a very particular place, like yeah. from one expression, right? But if it was an X and you want to like know, so, so if the prediction task if to, is, is to understand if it's an X or a Y or a Z, right. and so and all of these are type compatible at that point, uh, you know, uh, based on whatever notion of typing, if you're removing the X and if the task is to predict that X, mm -hmm. so any of those data, like X and Y and Z before this point in the program could have had completely different evolutions, completely different expression sure. trees right. or life values. So the data flow edges of x, y, or z would be different. So when you're replicating those, like when you're creating those mock nodes for each type correct candidate, are we actually putting the data flow edges as if everyone was x was the correct variable, or as if everyone was their own respective like? Uh, so there, there are data there are data flows everywhere, right? So yeah. what you're talking about is that the data flow that happened above was different, and that's true. Right, but at this point of the code, you know the data flow that happened before is irrelevant. What matters is the data flow in this expression that you're talking about right now. Like what I what I drew there is kind of the representation of one line, one statement in your code. Yes. Regardless of what it, whatever is happening before, like y and z can have different data flows, and you're absolutely right. But at this point, this expression dictates what the data flow is. Yeah, but if I. If, but if I've erased the identity of, of X that was the true label, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't know. Like I shouldn't be able to know if, if the problem is not to be leaky. I shouldn't know if it's X or Y or Z. So that's right. Yes. So how am I like prevent? If, if you're replicating only the correct data flow, how am I gonna know that? Like, so that, that's that's what we're doing. So the, the edges that depend on what the variable is are the ones that go down and go with the candidate, right? And the edges that don't depend on what the, is it X. So there are two types of edges, you're right. Like one type is it depends is it X, Control Y, or Z, Z yeah. right? The other one is it doesn't matter if it is X or Y or Z. Yeah. The ones that don't depend on that stay and represent the context for you. And the ones that depend on that go down and replicate for all the candidates. If you have four candidates, the edges that depend on is it X, is it Y, or is it Z, replicate three times with all those edges, and they give you the representation that is, if I used X, this would have been my representation. If I used Y, this would have been my representation. Okay, okay. Right? So every, everyone, like every, every variable name goes with its own respective like, data flow. Like, we, don't, we don't copy and paste the correct data flow to every candidate. Everyone goes right. with their own. Right. Like, okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Like, I just wanted to clear up something like yeah. like so um, these can't what like when we block when we replace the variable name with the slot like we re erase the identity but like because we're only replacing one variable right like we know that it it's like was the one that was y it's like it, it, if like, we have three variables in the program let's say and we blank out y and replace it with slot then slot is still one variable like throughout the program, right? Sure. Like, like there shouldn't be any confusion that this slot was, it's like we should know that this slot cannot be X because X wasn't blanked out, right, in the program. And Z wasn't blanked out, like, am I making it worse? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, yeah. But at any one time, we're only blanking out. No, it can have the confusion, right? Like if, like each of the nodes, like say if you have X that happened four times in a code, right? right. It can happen, it would have four nodes at different time yeah, steps yeah, yeah, in the yeah. sequence, right? right? On the terminal nodes of the ASD, right? Right. So, and you're removing one of these, let's right. say the third occurrence, and since you're removing that, like how, how would you say that if, if it was X, it wasn't Y, it was Z? Oh, I see. As long as the type is correct, it compiles, oh, and Y could be, like in the example that I showed you in the, in the start, at the beginning, like there was the first and class, right? So there is, 
there is no way that you can tell if it is first or class unless you learn that the pattern of behavior is that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. So you understood so far that uh, essentially you want to predict a certain node, uh, the variable node, and what you do is that you divide it in two. One is a, a v slot, a placeholder with all the edges that. Uh, don't depend on uh, what that variable is and you create say you have four candidates so you create four uh, so you don't create you connect to the four variable nodes uh, that are candidates for this uh, place in your program and add the edges that depend on those variables to those and you train this graph until uh, it converges to some final state and you call the final state of the slot uh, node as the context because that's capturing the context around the place that you want to predict. And you call this one usage representation because that's the representation if you, if you had used that particular uh, candidate variable in that place. Um, this is not working. Uh, and so finally what you want to do is uh, is to figure out which one is the right variable which is something that I still have problem exactly understanding but essentially so T is the time inside your sequence right uh, and C of T is the context for that particular part of that you're trying to do the prediction for. Uh, and V is the variable, C is the context, U is the usage. So what you do is that you look for the arg, arg max over all variables of this function W of C and U. And W is, let's just doing this. And W is, Uh, is a linear uh, layer that is uh, that is a result of the concatenation of C and U, uh, and then you uh, maximize. Sorry, you use an objective function that is max morph. I have no idea what I said, but <laughs> my, my interpretation of what I said is the following. Uh, so you learned two vectors for each of the variables, right? So you learn C and you learn U. You concatenate these two, and you do an SVM sort of thing. That's what I understand from max margin, unless somebody knows what that is. Uh, and essentially, what are you doing with your SVM is that you're learning this hyperplane that does a maximum separation between your correct variables and the incorrect ones. And then essentially the linear function is uh, the linear function normal to that hyperplane and you look for the maximum, uh, uh, the variable that gives you a maximum value to W. So essentially the farthest point from your uh, separation hyperplane. Does anyone else understand anything more from this? Reminds me of SVM, but support. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Support vector machines. It's an Yeah. I mean, it's it's not exactly SVM, but it's borrowing ideas from it. You're watermarking basically. Yeah, you're marking your um, your usage representation with like the variable indices, and then use whatever like has the maximum margin in your learned SVM. Yeah. Or you kind of yeah, you kind of drive your SVM vector in training to kind of. Give maximum margin to the one to the one that is like the correct one. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, like that, you choose what is what is the best variable for this place. Uh, so is this W found? Say again. You, the w you, you train for that. So you train W, which is a linear layer, uh, with this objective. Oh, okay. So do they do like uh, SVM training for this? Because like the only signal that you're getting is from from after the arg max. So you know what I mean? Like, do you train this like an SVM, like a non-linear SVM, or like? Uh, I don't know. They don't say anything. Uh, we, we 
like Ersan and I spend a lot of time this afternoon trying to decode this, but this is all they say really. Like I'm copy based from their paper and that's all the information they provide. Um, so it's very difficult to figure out what the objective function is here exactly, uh, but the best that I could come up with is what I said. So, so if we guess that's the, if, if we assume whatever you said is the objective function, then the rest you are training your uh, neural net with that objective function. Right? Does that make sense? The cost is the cost function. Yeah. yeah, that's a decision rule, though. As as a, this is after you've trained. Yeah. What I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What I'm saying, saying was you, the cost function. Right, you, you train for W, but then to decide if it is right or not, mm -hmm. you use this hard max. Yeah. Anything? Any any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, they don't. They don't talk about the data set for variable naming, or at least I haven't seen it. But for variable misuse, they use a uh, bunch of open source c -sharp projects. Uh, they do a bunch of filtering and choose 29 projects, uh, 2.9 million non-empty code uh, lines. For each of the missing variables that they're trying to predict, or uh, for each of the variables that they remove and try to predict, there are almost four type correct alternatives uh, on average. Uh, and they uh, divide, they grab 23 of the 29 projects and call them scene projects, they train on these and they test on the unseen projects which are three projects. Um, there are a bunch of baselines that they uh, look at. I am going to admit that I don't understand how these work again. <laughs> Uh, but the local model is essentially forgetting about the graph, uh, treating the source code as uh, tokens, and doing a uh, bidirectional GRU on it. So the way you do, uh, I guess, machine translation, for example. Uh, so that's that's one of their baselines. Uh, they talk about what the context uh, function and uh, usage function are for this one, but I don't remember what that is. Uh, but then they change the usage function in this one, the average by RNN. So they use a bidirectional RNN in this one to calculate. So in this one, they hard code the context function and the usage function. In this one, they compute it using a bidirectional RNN. Uh, and this one seems like they just use something, uh, they use a log bilinear model on four to the left, four to the right. Four to the right. It is essentially worth the make, that's right. On, on. But none of these baselines uh, consider the graph nature of the source code. And these are the results they get, and obviously they're the best. <laughs> uh, so GGNN is them, and these are, well, all of these are them, uh, but these are the GGNN, and those are the baseline models. Uh, that's for variable misuse and variable naming. So they get about 85% for uh, variable misuse uh, and 53% for variable naming. They're pretty impressive, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and on unseen projects, they get 78 and 44. Uh, they also look at, uh, so some of the design decisions that they made about, say, the edges that they added and all that, they remove some of these to see what happens. So the standard model is up here. So 85% for variable misuse, 53 for variable naming. Um, and if you only use next token, child, last use, last write, you get these. So essentially, uh, they see the effect of removing some of the edges on, uh, on the tasks that you're looking at. Um, which one is more interesting? Uh, so this one is interesting because uh, if they include only syntax edges, which is next token and child, so no data flow, uh, the accuracy drops significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one, they show a bunch of examples of uh, source code that they run this on uh, at the end of the paper in the appendix. 
uh, and I chose this one bit because it makes a mistake. Uh, uh, but like the 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 type correct um, variables that you have here are message response and message with capital M. Um, and in all places that they removed, it predicts it right except three. Uh, that makes a mistake. I think that's about it. Uh, so the, they have the data set. It's about 14 gigabyte, I think, uh, open source. So you can download that and use it. And the data set, I think, is the uh, is the graphs of the source code. It's not just the source code. So these parts you can use. Uh, and their uh, gated graph neural net is on GitHub here. Uh, in, in, in this repo, they're using it for some chemical stuff, but I guess uh, changing it to whatever you want to try should be easy. 